Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the head table, Dr. William Graham, science advisor to the president, Mr. Eric Block, director, National Science Foundation, the Secretary of Energy, John Harrington, the Secretary of Defense, Casper Weinberger, the Secretary of State, George Schultz. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Mr. President, Secretary Schultz, Secretary Weinberger, Secretary Harrington, Mr. Block, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce the joint sponsor of this meeting and the chairman of this session, the Honorable John Harrington, Secretary of Energy, who will introduce our keynote speaker. It's a great honor and privilege to welcome the President of the United States to this conference on commercial applications for superconductivity. His presence here today demonstrates his personal support and personal leadership as we go forward to meet these challenges. Those of us who have known him over the years, since his first days in public office, have known about his deep commitment to science and technology. As Governor of California, he had the responsibility for the stewardship of three great scientific centers in this country, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, and the Livermore National Laboratory. As president, he has challenged us, as no other president before him, to look to the future. His vision has been demonstrated through his record of continued support for investment in science and technology, high-risk research and development, and through his initiatives for American competitiveness. For 1988, the President has requested more than $9 billion for basic research, and that represents more than a 50% increase in federal support for basic research since 1982. Over the next five years, the President has proposed a commitment that will double the budget for the National Science Foundation. This new funding for the National Science Foundation will amount to about $10 billion over the next 10 years. By 1992, the 1980 funding level for the National Science Foundation's investment in basic science will have been tripled. And when taken together with his decision, his far-sighted decision, to support the superconducting supercollider, it represents an unparalleled, unparalleled growth potential for the United States science and technology. Mr. President, we are deeply grateful for your joining us here today as we move forward to meet the challenges of superconductivity. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, and thank you all very much. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to Washington and an honor to address this assembly of some of the foremost members of our scientific and business community. I'm pleased to announce, though, I'm going to take a liberty here before getting on with the subject that brought us together. 
uh, to pause for a moment for an announcement of something that I think is of interest to all of us, that today our delegation to the Geneva discussions on intermediate range nuclear missiles is putting forward a formal U.S. proposal that embodies two earlier suggestions made by the United States. In November of 1981, we promised elimination or eliminating the entire class of long-range intermediate missiles. On June 15th, we then formally offered to eliminate the shorter-range INF weapons as well. As perhaps some of you know, until last week, the Soviet Union had insisted on what could have been a major stumbling block to our double-zero suggestion, the re right to retain some of its missiles currently deployed in Asia. But last Wednesday, General Secretary Gorbachev announced that he was preparing to drop this demand. As I say, the proposal put forward today would reduce to zero the number of both longer-range and shorter-range INF missiles, and we are pleased the Soviets have now expressed support for both concepts. It would make provisions for strict and effective verification and reject transfer of existing U.S. and Soviet INF missiles and launchers to any third party. Two vital new elements are also included the destruction of missiles and launchers covered by the treaty, and no conversion of these systems and launchers to other types of weapons. There's still much to do in Geneva, but I'm heartened that the climate is now receptive to an historic proposal of this type. The United States is proud to be in a position to make this proposal. I can only add that there are other arms reduction negotiations going on as well, and these concern strategic or longer range nuclear forces. We have tabled our proposal in the form of a proposed START treaty, and we hope the Soviet Union will do likewise and formalize their views in this area. Our goal, as you can see, is not arms control, but arms reduction. And despite the skepticism when we first announced these plans, we are moving in this direction. Now, before I begin our discussion, <laughs> Thank you. And now, before I begin our discussion of the vital subject that's brought us here today, there is one person I must mention, a moving force in getting this conference underway. He was a patriot, a fine cabinet officer, and a champion of American enterprise, and we will truly miss Mac Baldrige. But we're privileged to have here today with us many of those scientists whose pioneering work made this conference on superconductivity a possibility. And congratulations to you all. And it's a safe bet that this conference room also contains many of the minds and spirits who will carry this revolution forward, who will open up a whole new realm of heretofore unimagined possibilities and practical applications. I've had a lot of experience in my own career of how technology can change things. I remember back in the 20s when somebody first told Harry Warner uh, about talking pictures, and he said, who the heck wants to hear actors talk? Well, actually, uh, uh, actually, I don't think he said heck, but <laughs> presidents aren't allowed the same license as studio executives. Of course, when it comes to high tech, presidents often have trouble, too, keeping up with the times. A favorite story of mine is about one of the first times the White House hosted a science and technology event. A demonstration of a recently invented device was put on, the, on for President Rutherford B. Hayes. That's an amazing invention, he said. But who would ever want to use one of them? He was talking about the telephone. It's hard to believe that it's been less than one year since we first heard news of the startling breakthrough in superconductivity by two scientists in the IBM labs in Zurich. And since then, it seemed as if the papers have had to struggle to keep up with the rapid advance up the Kelvin scale. You know, it's been said that there are three stages of reaction to any new idea. One, it won't work. Two, even if it works, it's not useful. And three, I said it was a great idea all along. <laughs> well, 
To most of us laymen, superconductivity was a completely new term, but it wasn't long before we learned of the great promise it held out to alter our world for the better, a quantum leap in energy efficiency that would bring with it a host of benefits, not least among them a reduced dependence on foreign oil, a cleaner environment, and a stronger national economy. I've been accused of being an incurable optimist, but lately I've been playing catch-up ball with the usually more staid science profession. And the other day I met with Dr. Graham and the members of the White House Science Council for a briefing on superconductivity. Edward Teller told me that we have seen discoveries in the laboratory these last eight months that the optimists who thought we wouldn't make for 200 years. One theorist was quoted as saying, it shows all the dreams that we've had can come true. The sky is the limit. Well, these, there are predictions of high-speed trains levitated above their tracks, supercomputers on a single silicon chip, cheaper and more effective medical imaging devices. But I suspect that we haven't even begun to dream the possibilities or imagine the potential. Just as no one imagined 747s making transatlantic commercial flights when the Wright brothers first flew at Kitty Hawk, and no one dreamt of the computer or the communications satellite when Ben Franklin first captured electricity from a lightning bolt. It was Ben Franklin who wrote, I have sometimes almost wished it had been my destiny to be born two or three centuries hence, for invention and improvement are prolific and beget more of their kind. The present progress is rapid. Many of great importance, now unthought of, will before that period be produced. And then I might not only enjoy their advantages, but have my curiosity gratified in knowing what they are to be. Well, the present process is rapid, and it seems constantly accelerating. One can imagine how gratified Ben Franklin would be if he were alive today. But you know, I bet he would join me, and I'm sure most others in this room, in wishing that we had a window to the future 10, 20, and 100 years hence, so that we too could see the marvels of the coming age. There's something universal in that sentiment, I'm sure, but I can't help but feel that there's something especially American in the optimism, the certainty of hope and faith with which we look to the future. 200 years ago, Thomas Jefferson said, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. Well, since that time, we've built here something entirely new, a history in which Thomas Jefferson would have felt more at home. It is a history that is constructed of dreams, dreamt in freedom, and realized in a land of opportunity. Science tells us that the breakthroughs in superconductivity bring us to the threshold of a new age. It's our task at this conference to herald in that new age with a rush, if you will. It's our business to discover ways to turn our dreams into history as quickly as possible. The laboratory breakthroughs into high temperature superconductivity are an historic achievement. But for the promise of superconductivity to become real, it must bridge the gap from the laboratory to the marketplace. It must make the transition from a scientific phenomenon to an everyday reality, from a specialty item to a commodity. And that's why we, we're here in this conference, so that business and science can cross-fertilize, can begin at these early stages to dream and plan together, because this new age of superconductivity is a new arena for the spirit of enterprise, one that we can't even guess the limits of. We also want to see how we in government can do our part in helping this process along. Now, I have to the government be nervous. We've learned from experience that the helping hand of government too often has a crushing weight. I'm reminded of what Werner von Braun once said about America's space program. He said, we can lick gravity but sometimes the paperwork is overwhelming. <laughs> well, this is not to say that government doesn't have an important role, especially at the basic research level. We must continue to support our outstanding researchers in all disciplines, 
giving them the freedom of resources and flexibility they need to dream their dreams and make their experiments. One key for doing this is the National Science Foundation, and we have proposed, as you've been told, to double its budget over the next five years. As you may know, the National Science Foundation and NASA provided funding for Dr. Paul Chu's landmark experiments at the University of Houston. Increasingly, in this last part of the 20th century, information is becoming the most valuable commodity. We have begun major initiatives at our national laboratories to improve communication. And last April, I signed an executive order ensuring that all federal agencies and laboratories become partners with the private sector in moving research from the laboratories to the marketplace. The message of government is simple. We have an open door policy to the private sector. Cooperation wherever and whenever possible is the order of the day. We must also move to protect intellectual property and write protections into the Freedom of Information Act for scientific and technical information generated by government laboratories. We need to strengthen patent laws to increase protection for manufacturing processes and speed up the patent process so that it can keep pace with a fast-paced world of high technology. And of critical importance, we must modernize our antiquated antitrust laws, laws designed for a previous century that only held America or hold America back and give our foreign competition an unfair advantage. If we're serious, about improving American competitiveness, the way to do it isn't through protectionist trade legislation that closes markets and throws people out of work. One good place to start is bringing antitrust laws up to speed with the modern world. This is no longer the era of the so-called robber barons. It's the age of high-tech and global competition. Let's stop penalizing American business and treating it like an enemy. Let's give ourselves a fair shake in the world marketplace. I will soon send a legislative initiative to Congress addressing these three issues, antitrust, patents, and the Freedom of Information Act, as they relate to the commercial application of superconductor technology. I hope you will lend your support to this legislation. Your opinions matter to your senators and representatives. Let them know how you feel individually and through your various trade organizations. This package of reforms will go a long way toward preserving the competitive advantage of U.S. industries in this field. These and other actions are part of an 11-point superconductivity initiative that will also include a wise men's advisory group on federal policies and regulations that affect superconductivity research and commercialization. The Quick Start grants for good ideas on processing superconducting materials into useful forms. The establishment of a number of superconductivity research centers and a nearly $150 million research and development effort by the Department of Defense over three years. Funding basic research, sharing information, removing the impediments to commercialization. In this way, government can be a catalyst to the future but we have an even more important role that we must be sure to accomplish. It is a fundamental role that not only looks forward to the 21st century, but harks back to the first principles enunciated in our Constitution 200 years ago. First, we must recognize that just as recent breakthroughs in superconductivity have outrun existing theories and brought us to the threshold of a new world of opportunities, so too the world around us is in the process of a radical transformation a revolution of shattered paradigms and long-held certainties. This transformation, too, is opening for us new horizons of possibility. In a recent article, The New American Challenge, the economist George Gilder describes this new reality and how we must respond to it. The information age has only just begun, he says. Increasingly, we are moving from the economy of the Industrial Revolution an economy tied to the Earth's natural resources, to an economy based on information, where that old cliché, knowledge is power, is truer than ever. It's estimated that raw materials account for 80% of the cost of pots and pans, 40% of automobiles, 
and less than 2% for an integrated circuit. The value of a silicon chip doesn't lie in the sand from which it comes, but in the microscopic architecture engraved upon it by ingenious human minds. The most promising superconductors are made from ceramics. Their value doesn't come from their material, but from the brilliant inspiration of a few scientists. It is the human imagination that is building the 21st century out of sand and clay. We're increasingly moving from an age of things to an age of thoughts, an age of mind over matter. In this new age, it's the mind of man, free to invent, free to experiment, that is our most precious resource. Gold, steel, oil, these were the treasures of the past that made people rich and nations strong. Today, the premium is on the human heart and mind. They can't be locked in a vault, nationalized or expropriated. They can only be let free, and then really, the sky is the only limit. That is the American challenge. Will we continue the policies of economic freedom, of non-inflationary growth, of low and flatter tax rates and deregulation? Will we strengthen them with an economic bill of rights so that they will never again be lost. When I signed our tax reform legislation into law, I noted that the last 20 years had witnessed an expansion of many of our civil liberties, but that our economic liberties had been too often neglected, even abused. We protect the freedom of expression of the author as we should, but what of the freedom of expression of the entrepreneur whose pen and paper are capital and profits, whose book may be a new invention or small business? What are the creators of our economic life whose contributions may not only delight the mind, but improve the condition of man by feeding the poor with new grains, bringing hope to the sick with new cures, vanquishing ignorance with wondrous new information technologies? When our forefathers wrote guarantees of life, liberty, and property into our Constitution. They tapped a wellspring of hope and creativity that has transformed history. That basic blueprint they laid down, the Constitution, whose 200th birthday we celebrate this year, is, if anything, more vital than ever. That secular trinity of life, liberty, and property is the key to the future, the key to meeting and winning the new American challenge. Archibald MacLeish once said, there are those I know who will reply that the liberation of humanity, the freedom of man and mind, is nothing but a dream. And then he said, they are right. It is the American dream. You here today will be among the pioneers carrying on that American dream into the future, a day when this 20th century of ours may seem no more than a rough prototype of the 21st. I wish you well with the rest of your conference. You've captured the American, or the imagination of the American people, and I'm sure I can speak for them all when I say our hearts and hopes and best wishes go with you. Thank you all very much, and God bless you all. particular session just a few minutes late, and so we'll assemble just a few minutes after 1.30 back in the International Ballroom. It's my, my pleasure to introduce the chairman for this luncheon session. The chairman is the Honorable Donald Fuqua, the director of the Washington, D.C. Office of the Aerospace Industries Association of America. Many of, him, many of you know him better uh, 
as a distinguished representative in Congress. From 1963 until 1986, Mr. Fuqua represented the Florida's second congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives. And during that period, uh, he was chairman of the Committee on Science and Technology with budget oversight and responsibility for virtually all the scientific and technologically related agencies in the federal government. And I would also add that he has been a great friend to science, technology, and research over the many years he was in Congress and still today. My pleasure to introduce the Honorable Don Fuqua. Don. Thank you very much, Dr. Graham, and it's a great pleasure to be here today. And I'd first like to applaud the mission of the conference to explore ways of making a tremendous technology of the future or taking a tremendous technology of the future into the marketplace. This is a matter of great interest to the members of the Aerospace Industries Association, and we're currently working on a similar project to spotlight the key technologies that will be the cutting edge of the 1990s and, and beyond. Getting people to focus on the future is a difficult job, and especially in an environment where we have budgetary concerns for today and many far outweigh uh, the concerns of the future. And that's why a conference such as this are so important. And I know all of you here today uh, understand that. We as a group must continually work together to educate the public about the importance of technology to our industrial base and retaining the U.S. leadership in the global marketplace. And it's a message that bears repeating. Well, I'm not here today to give a speech. I'm here to introduce our next speaker, Ambassador Clayton Yider. And you may know that uh, how important Ambassador Yider is to the aerospace economy. Uh, with all of his global influence around the world, uh, he single-handedly is responsible for the continuing growth of the air transport industry. We thank you very much for that. But joking aside, when Bill Graham asked me to come here today to in introduce Ambassador Yider, I couldn't have been more pleased because I'm one of his greatest fans. Ambassador Yider joined the administration in 1985. He came from one pressure cooker as the president of the and CEO of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to the world's second largest futures market. Uh, to another, and during Ambassador Yider's tenure at the Merck, it was one of the fastest growing, most dynamic private sector organizations in the United States. During the early 1970s, when I first came to know Dr. Yider, he served in a series of sub-cabinet posts during the Nixon and Ford administration, first uh, as the Assistant Secretary of Agriculture for Marketing and Consumer Services, where he had charge of the nation's major agricultural regulatory program, meat inspection and animal health and so forth, and its food programs. Then he served for time as Assistant Secretary for International Affairs and Commodity Programs and was involved in the dramatic expansion of farm exports during the mid-1970s. Finally, he served as Deputy Special Trade Representative during the Tokyo Round of Multilateral Trade Negotiations and also handled many of the bilateral negotiations during the Ford years. Ambassador Yider holds a PhD in agricultural economics as well as a law degree. He is still remembered for having worked on the graduate level program simultaneously while managing a 2,500 acre farm and for ranking first scholastically in both. Ambassador Yider went from high school through his PhD without ever having a course below a grade level of A. And today, as the United States Trade Representative, Ambassador Yider is responsible for the development of American trade policy and for its execution. And he has the challenging task of coordinating U.S. negotiating position on all trade issues of importance to the country and the further task of devising a strategy and tactics that will bring about successful negotiations. And Ambassador, it's going to be somewhat like speaking on the floor of the House to this group with some of the rattling that's going on, but I'm sure that you will master this task. And ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present to you your next speaker and still a A-plus performer for everything he does, Ambassador Clayton Yider. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Don. It's, uh, it's great to be here with all of you, and I congratulate Bill Graham and all the other organizers of this event uh, uh, within the administration for pulling together a group of this uh, uh, size and, uh, and repute uh, for this kind of a session. I think it's a tribute to everybody, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, and then I was going to say, Don, that uh, I got a little practice the other night for talking above all this din. I did a speech out in Montana, and I've never had this happen to me before. I was uh, just you know, proceeded to the podium to speak like this, and we were on the second floor of this hotel, and down below there was a wedding reception, and the rock band began to play. <laughs> and <laughs> I have never had to try to speak over a rock band before, but uh, that was quite a challenge indeed. Uh, on a much more serious note, uh, as many of you know, uh, Secretary of Commerce Baldridge would have delivered the luncheon address to you today had he been here, and as all of you know, uh, uh, he met an untimely death at about the time that I was getting ready to do that speech in Montana, and uh, you know, all of us uh, share that as a tragedy for the country, and in my case, a great uh, personal tragedy because I worked with him so much on a daily basis, sometimes almost on an hourly basis, was so fond of him. He's a marvelous American, a form, tremendous Secretary of Commerce, and uh, all of us will miss him tremendously. And uh, uh, although I will assuredly enjoy talking to you, uh, uh, I'm really uh, uh, deeply, deeply distressed to, to do it in this set of uh, circumstances. Uh, <coughs> now to business. <coughs> You've uh, already had considerable discussion of, uh, of superconductivity this morning, and you'll have some more this afternoon, and I think that's, uh, that's marvelous. This is one of the, uh, the great developments uh, in this world, something that you understand much more than I do. Uh, I'd like to put it a little more and put it in perspective, if I can possibly do so, from my viewpoint as a government official who is very interested in international trade and the development of the international competitiveness of this nation. Um, and I like to put it in perspective uh, uh, from a viewpoint of being a former businessman and a, a former uh, university professor and uh, uh, having done a lot of other things that are a mixture of, uh, of science and technology and, and business. Let me start out by saying that I, uh, there should be uh, no doubt in anybody's minds about the importance of technology. Uh, uh, to this world today and the uh, importance of, uh, of getting there fastest with the mostest, uh, which is uh, one reason why we're holding this conference here today. <coughs> There's one thing to develop the technology. It's another thing to have the United States of America and American firms be uh, the primary beneficiaries of that technology, at least in uh, economic terms. And it's not that we don't want to share it with the world. It's just that uh, we'd like to make a buck uh, in the process uh, uh, if we can possibly do so. I thought about this a bit, uh, Bill, as I was talking to that agricultural audience in, man, in uh, uh, Montana over the weekend because we were focusing in that meeting on some technological issues relating to agriculture and food production. And uh, the reflections of that meeting are, are perhaps a lesson to us all in technology generally because they indicated how fast the world can change. And I suspect that some indication of how fast change can occur as superconductivity develops uh, into commercial applications. Uh, I hope there will be some analogies to what's happened in agriculture over the last decade or so. Uh, but, but let me just cite this as, a, as, a, as an example of, uh, of how rapidly things do change. Uh, as Don Fuqua indicated, I was here as an assistant secretary of agriculture back in the 1970s uh, at a time when we were worried about food shortages. Uh, you'll remember we had a World Food Conference in Rome in which everybody was concerned about how we were going to feed the world uh, years hence. People were writing books all over the place. In fact, the very reputable economists and agricultural economists were pouring out volumes in the early 70s saying that the world was on the edge of Malthusianism and we were going to have millions of starving people and there was probably nothing that we could do about it. It's now 10 or so years later. One of the people who was on the program with me in Montana was a very distinguished scientist, uh, agricultural scientist, a good friend of mine, and uh, he was 
relating this scenario and saying, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, if we'd had a meeting like this, if somebody would have said that uh, a decade from now, we're going to have 5 billion people on the face of the earth, and we're going to have the capacity to feed them all, nobody would have believed it. Nobody. Because the fear was that we would have mass starvation if and when we ever reached 5 billion people. Today, we have 5 billion people on the face of the earth, <clears throat> and the same scientist said at the meeting uh, on Saturday that for the first time in the last two or three years, we've reached the point where there are ample food supplies to feed an adequate diet, provide an adequate diet for all of those 5 billion people. And we've come a long way in 10 years. And this isn't to suggest that there is no starvation in the world. Obviously, there are distribution problems involved in that picture and purchasing prior problems. But the fact of the matter is science and technology and management provided uh, the uh, way by which we, we responded to that problem uh, as a globe over the last uh, decade and responded very effectively. Time will tell whether superconductivity will have that same effect. Time will tell. Clearly, the United States was a major beneficiary of, many, of much of that development in agriculture over the last 10 or 12 years. We became uh, the world's largest exporter of food products because a lot of the research and development activity in agriculture was put to use commercially here in the United States. We didn't get it all by any means, and we've had our comparative advantage in agricultural exports uh, moderated and, uh, and impeded in, in a dramatic way by practices of other nations. And that, too, is something we must be concerned about uh, with in, in terms of the evolution of superconductivity and the, super, and the commercial applications of what is involved in this particular research and development endeavor. So let's learn some lessons uh, from the experiences that we've had over the last decade, whether they've been in agriculture or in other areas. Putting it another way, it certainly behooves us to make sure that we're not only out in front in uh, R&D activities in areas like superconductivity and, and other new areas of great interest and great potential, but that we go beyond uh, the scientific endeavors and, uh, and, and capture at least a significant uh, segment of the economic benefits that arrive therefrom, and we have to do that through commercial applications. We do have to get there quickly. Now, we can protect some of those commercial benefits, some of the economic benefits for the, the United States as a nation and for American firms through patent uh, uh, operations, obviously, and trademarks and, and other mechanisms that preserve and protect intellectual property. But we must go beyond that because scientific knowledge is diffused very rapidly in the world today, as all of you know. And there is only uh, uh, limited protection that's available through the uh, patent process and other such techniques. A lot of it moves very rapidly, and that means commercialization has to come along quickly. And one of the reasons that Bill Graham and I and others wanted to have you come in uh, for this session, and I'm talking particularly now about private businessmen who are here, venture capitalists and entrepreneurs, is that uh, in the fast-moving world in which we live today, you've got to get there quickly. And quickly is defined differently today than it would have been defined 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, I'll give you another example of that. I was on a program uh, at, uh, in Boston just a, uh, oh, a few months ago in which we were talking about international trade and international competitiveness. Uh, it was a banker uh, conference. And I was on the program with one of the major CEOs of, uh, in the world, a man who headed a, a chemical company in uh, Great Britain that is one of the principal uh, exporters of chemical products around the world. And <clears throat> we were talking about trade principles and policies in that particular session. And he was making the point that uh, uh, he personally would do everything that he could to head off the trends toward protectionism in the world because he didn't feel that was the right way to go. Uh, that he felt the world would be better off uh, if we follow the principles of free and open trade 
and diffuse the knowledge that many of you here in this room provide uh, throughout uh, the globe and permit everybody to have a shot at the benefits of a, of a free and open system where, uh, where all can raise their levels of living. And then he kind of smiled and said, but as a CEO, he said, what I've discovered in the last few years is that I've got to run a lot faster to stay ahead. And uh, I think that's absolutely right. If you're in the private sector today and you're in a business that is international in scope, and most of them today are international in scope, then you've got to run faster to stay ahead. And one of the ways you obviously can stay ahead in that kind of competition is through the rapid commercial application of new technology as it's developed. That happens to be an American challenge today, and we ought to recognize it as such and do something about it. I'll return to that in just a minute. One approach, of course, in dealing with this kind of challenge is an approach that is followed by some other countries around the world, and there are some who suggest that we should emulate that. I don't happen to agree with that, but I think it's important that we all understand how other people react to opportunities such as the one that's presented here in superconductivity. I'm talking primarily about our friends in Japan, of course, uh, because they're a classic example of this, but one can make other, can articulate other examples as, as well. Uh, that, uh, the approach to which I have reference would be one in which the domestic market for a particular product or product area is rather carefully protected in the short run so that one need not face competition coming in from abroad. At the same time, of course, that provides some opportunities for local firms to, uh, to develop their efficiencies and their economies of scale in domestically while preparing for international competition. The government can come along and provide some assistance by targeting that industry uh, for particular economic benefits in capital investment or uh, R&D or whatever might be appropriate. Uh, and then beyond that, of course, encourage in a variety of ways uh, those industries or those firms in that, in that new arena to commercialize quickly, as I have just suggested, and then move into the international market as their economies of scale are accrue and, and compete very aggressively through dumping practices if necessary uh, to capture market share internationally. Uh, that is a scenario that has been followed on more than one occasion in more than one product category in more than one industry over the last couple of decades and in more than one country, I must say. That is a practice that we could emulate in superconductivity if we wished. It's a practice the United States could follow in a lot of things if we wished. But I hope we don't go that route. And I hope we can, can encourage other nations through the negotiating process, if no other way, uh, to abandon those kinds of efforts which really are not in the long-term best interest, in my judgment, uh, of anybody. We've begun to counter some of those practices from time to time. Uh, just in the last couple of years because we believe they reflect um, elements of unfairness to them in terms of the way international commerce is conducted. I use semiconductors as an example, another one of the uh, important high technology areas here in the, in the uh, United States and elsewhere in the world. Uh, semiconductor technology is obviously related to super technology and superconductivity. Uh, but in the semiconductor area, as you well know, we were concerned about some of these practices, in particular dumping practices that applied internationally. And not too long ago, we worked out uh, an agreement with the uh, government of Japan that was intended to uh, respond to that particular problem. And later on, when that agreement was not fully implemented, as you know, we applied sanctions against the government of Japan and sanctions which uh, applied against some Japanese uh, co semiconductor manufacturing companies because of the way their trade patterns were being conducted. I must say to you that that's, uh, that will not by any means be the first and only time that we will do that if we face, we the United States, face similar problems like that in the future. We do have authority under Section 301 of the trade law, which is our unfair pr trade practice provision, uh, to do a lot of things to preclude unfair competition of this nature, whether it applies in superconductivity uh, or anything else. 
Putting all this another way, I'm saying to you who are in the private sector and may choose to be involved in the, uh, in the development, developmental efforts here in superconductivity, and I'm also saying to the scientists who are trying to decide whether you want to spend any time in this area, that we in government, at least as long as I'm around, and as long as people like Mac Baldridge uh, are around, are going to try to do our best to make sure you operate on a level playing field internationally or as close to a level playing field as we can reasonably and feasibly come. Putting it still another way, we're going to be a lot less passive in these areas in the future than we have been in the past. We provided some opportunities to our competition in the past by being passive, and uh, we're just not uh, functioning that way any longer. We haven't been over the last couple of years. I hope we never are in the future. Uh, again, no matter who sits in the White House or whether the administration be, be Republican or Democrat. It seems to me it's in the best interest of the United States as a country, irrespective of who occupies these positions in government back in Washington, to make sure that that playing field for future economic development activities in fields like superconductivity is just as level as possible. And if we have to respond to targeting practices that we deem to be unfair or, or uh, sales practices such as dumping which we deem to be unfair or to export subsidy practices which could also fit the unfair trading category or whatever it may be that is designed to give an unfair or artificial edge to our competition, we ought to do that. And uh, I can make the, uh, the commitment to you that that will clearly be the case uh, for a substantial period of time to come, but obviously none of us can speak for the administrations that emerge in the, in the future. Now, let me return to the, uh, uh, the, the effort that'll, ha that'll be involved in attempting to uh, bring superconductivity to commercialization and attempt to do this for other areas in the future. I'd like to make just a couple comments on the long-term side of things and then on the shorter-term side of things, and we'll let you all get back on schedule. We're a little bit behind already. On the long-term side, I'd like to focus uh, your attention for just a minute to our inter basic underlying international competitiveness. And I do that because this is an audience that ought to have an impact on the public policies that are followed that uh, uh, that relate to our competitiveness picture internationally. Going back uh, historically a few months, President Reagan laid on the tables of the U.S. Congress uh, a very broad competitiveness package that had uh, a, a lot of dimensions to it. Uh, an impressive piece of work, I thought, and one which uh, has been incorporated in in many ways into the omnibus trade package that's now under consideration in the Congress. But there's some elements uh, that were not incorporated. There are others that uh, may or may not uh, remain in that legislation uh, when it uh, comes through to final passage uh, in a few weeks. And of course, there's some uh, question about whether the legislation itself uh, will uh, ever uh, see final passage or final uh, approval uh, because it has a lot of shortcomings to it that uh, uh, clearly have to be repaired if it's uh, going to avoid a presidential veto. But the point I wanted to make in this context is that as the omnibus uh, trade bill was debated in the Congress, that focus that was there in January on our international competitiveness seemed to fade. And as uh, the Congress got further and further into that legislative debate, it seemed simultaneously to move further and further away from basic considerations of competitiveness and productivity. Or putting it another way, the, uh, the Congress began to focus on its more parochial concerns uh, and uh, began to lose the sense of direction that prevailed as that particular debate began. I suppose to some degree that's inevitable because members of Congress represent parochial concerns in their districts. But it is regrettable from the standpoint of the people sitting in this, in this room that that occurred. And some of the important things, uh, things that are important to our future international competitiveness were lost in the discussion or simply did fade away. And we ought to go back and concentrate on those. Maybe it's too late to do it in the omnibus trade bill, but if so, let's do it in other legislation if need be, and let's make sure we get it done in the private sector too. And I'm talking about the basics. Uh, uh, a sound educational system that'll prepare us for the high technology world in which we're going to in which we're going to live. 
How do we develop commercial technology in superconductivity if we don't have people that are well prepared? We have to have an educated, literate workforce. We've got to go through uh, the kind of training programs that are essential uh, to, uh, to making superconductivity economically viable. Uh, we've got to work on management uh, and the basic fundamentals that are involved in, in making our firms a little more uh, uh, competitive than, uh, than some of their counterparts around the world. That's the sheer management. We need to look at work at the capital structure. Uh, what are we doing to uh, encourage capital formation in this country and the savings that are necessary to support that capital formation? That gets into tax policy. What about uh, human resource uh, potential and the motivation thereof? That's a part of the educational process, too. <clears throat> what about intellectual property protection, an issue to which I alluded earlier and one which is before the Congress right at the moment? What about regulatory reform, the regulations that impose a cost uh, on the development of superconductivity that may make it more difficult for our firms who are commercializing in this area to compete with other people's firms who are commercializing. Uh, are the regulations really necessary or is it something that on, on which we ought to take a pass? All of these factors are involved in, in the international competitiveness of the products that emerge from superconductivity. And you, who are influencing members of Congress throughout the United States, <clears throat> ought to get them to go back and focus on what we really have to do to ensure our international competitiveness in this area and a lot of other high-tech areas and uh, unrelated areas as we move to the future. Well, that's a challenge for you, and I will leave it with you. Let me shift to the short term for just a minute. I'm talking now primarily to the entrepreneurs in the room or the venture capitalists or the businessmen who have some interest in all this. Aside from everything that we do in the, sh in the long run, and aside from what our government may or may not be able to do for, for you, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that in this and most every other area, the basic responsibility for uh, success and the basic attributes for success are yours, not ours here in government and nobody uh, anywhere else. It's like that uh, chemical company CEO in Great Britain. He had to figure out how to run faster, and he's doing it every day of the week. We in the United States who are running uh, business firms who are engaged in international commerce or sh who should be engaged in international commerce, whether it be in products emer emerging from superconductivity or products emerging from other R&D efforts, we in the private sector have to do that job. Uh, we cannot shift the blame to the federal government or anybody else. Uh, it is our responsibility if we're in the private sector to get it done. CEOs are paid to succeed and they're paid to learn how to succeed whether you're operating in the competition of the domestic market here in the U.S. or you're prepared to succeed internationally, if that be your universe. Uh, in that regard, you've got to make, got to be decisive. Uh, there is no substitute for moving aggressively and decisively in new areas like this. You can't sit on your derrieres and, and wait until the competition is, is uh, six months or six years out ahead of you and then say, oh my God, why didn't I do this uh, back in 1987 or 88? You're responsible to get out front. That may entail some risks, but it is not a risk-free society in which we live. Uh, we chose to live under capitalism. I happen to think that was a good choice. I like that choice. I hope it will always be. Uh, but we must recognize that one of the attributes of that environment is that we have to be prepared to be risk takers. There are some opportunities for cooperation with government in this area. Bill Graham and others have outlined some of these already. I suspect they'll outline others uh, uh, as time goes along here. So here you do have a somewhat different situation where there may be some unique uh, opportunities for cooperation. You ought to take advantage of them. Reverting once to, for just a moment to the unfair trade practice side of things or the trade policy side, let me just say as, as the U.S. Trade Representative, that if you are being faced with a situation where you do not have a level playing field, you got to tell us. We can't help you if you don't ask for help. And so if as superconductivity develops and evolves, you have some of the difficulties that we've experienced in semiconductors and other products, please say so. The squeaky wheel gets the grease in Washington, in this and any other area. And if you don't speak up, you're not going to get help. Finally, it seems to me, we ought to close by saying that, uh, that this is not an area in which we ought to underestimate ourselves. And it's not an area in which we ought to, in any way, 
um, uh, be anything other than self-confident. <clears throat> I'm tired of listening to American businessmen tell me that they just can't compete anymore. I don't believe that. Putting that still another way, I don't think your competitors, whether they be in Japan or Korea or anywhere else, are 10 feet high. I think sometimes we grossly overestimate the competition and grossly underestimate ourselves. I think the United States can run with a superconductivity ball and do very, very well indeed, get our share of this business worldwide as it accrues, and maybe a little bit more. We've just got to challenge ourselves to do it, make the kind of decisions that are necessary in both government and the private sector to have that come about. And uh, I think the 1,400 people or so, or so people who are in this room ought to be able to have a very major and positive effect on that outcome. So with that, I simply say, good luck. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for this afternoon, who is Dr. Ernest Ambler. Dr. Ambler uh, will be delivering the speech which uh, Secretary of Commerce Malcolm Baldridge had planned to give to this meeting. In fact, Dr. Ambler joined the National Bureau of Standards, which is a, depart a part of the Department of Commerce, in 1953 and became its eighth director, eighth director in 1978. At the request of Secretary Baldridge, he then continued to serve as the NBS director during this administration. As director of the NBS, Dr. Ambler leads the nation's measurement laboratory in the studies of the physical sciences and engineering in standards, samples, and measurements. Throughout his career, he has made the NBS an increasingly valuable scientific and technical resource for our industry, business, our government, and our education. In fact, Dr. Ambler has worked in cryogenic and low temperature physics extensively during his career. He's also received the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service, and he frequently represents the United States' interests in international activities and standards. So let me introduce Dr. Ernest Ambler. Thank you, Bill. The circumstances uh, under which I get to uh, deliver this uh, speech are very sad indeed. But uh, in a sense, since it has to be done, I'm very proud to be able to do it. I've worked uh, for Mr. Baldridge, uh, as Bill mentioned, uh, from the beginning of this administration. And uh, like most uh, people in the Department of Commerce, we're very fond of him. The, uh, the thing about uh, Mr. Baldridge was that uh, he was a, a former chief executive officer and he understood the importance of technology and the importance of manufacturing very well, and we always felt was a very strong supporter of ours. So I'm simply going to read to you what he would have said at lunchtime today. Thank you. I'm pleased to participate in this conference on the commercial applications of superconductivity. I congratulate Bill Graham, the President Science Advisor, for convening it. I'd also like to congratulate our scientific community for its initiative in channeling its research into this new class of super, uh, superconducting compounds. The creativity and hard work of those engaged in this project are a credit to our nation. I wish I could give an award to everyone in industry, government, and academia whose efforts have helped turn the discipline of low temperature physics upside down. This new technology is in its early stages in the daily, sometimes it seems hourly, reports of advances during the past few months 
show its enormous potential. But we can't let the excitement from the laboratory blind us to the fact that we've got to overcome significant technical problems. I'm confident that we can overcome these obstacles and do so quickly. And we're here today to talk about the commercial opportunities after we resolve those technical difficulties. That makes this conference special because it represents the way we should be managing new technologies. If we were still doing business the old way, this session probably would not have taken place. In the past, new technologies were explored at technical conferences attended only by scientists and engineers. Discussions about commercial app opportunities mainly occurred in private, in corporate boardrooms and in think tanks. Sessions like this usually took place after the technologies already had been generated in the laboratories. But the world marketplace has changed dramatically and we no longer can conduct business as usual when it comes to a technology as economically promising and strategic as the new superconductors. There is more than enough work to go around for government, universities, and industry. Our role, the federal government's role, is to help fund and conduct basic research into the high temperature superconductivity phenomenon. It's also our job to conduct applied research into areas that meet the needs of the various federal agencies involved. I'm speaking of the National Bureau of Standards within the Department of Commerce, the Department of Energy with its several research laboratories, the Department of Defense, and the National Science Foundation. By redirecting existing resources, these agencies already have doubled their research efforts in superconductivity. We'll see an increase in federal R&D programs as more resources become available through the budget process. It's also the federal government's job to make it possible and easier for the private sector to get the job done. Other parts of my department and the executive branch are doing that by improving the climate for business in America to innovate and compete. One of our top priorities is to eliminate the obsolete antitrust restrictions that shackle our industries. But I'm convinced that no matter how hard the federal government tries to make the new superconductors a commercial and economic success, our efforts will fail if the private sector does not take the lead. Government can help industry solve its problems not just in superconductivity, but in a host of other technologies. But government is not the solution to those problems. Our difficulties did not come from a lack of science or technological genius. We've certainly kept pace with the competition in developing new technologies. But we've lost time and time again in reaping the commercial and economic benefits that come from the successful marketing of the products of those technologies. There are signs that the United States industry has learned its lesson and is turning things around. Manufacturing productivity is up. Industrial R&D is up. We are seeing a new wave of joint R&D ventures that have been spurred by changes in the antitrust laws, which make it less risky for companies to form research consortia. And industry also has been providing more money for work by scientists and engineers at universities. But have we learned from our mistakes in the past? I hope so, but worry when I see surveys like the one Lou Harris recently conducted for Coopers and Librand. That survey of Fortune 500 top manufacturing executives and engineers show that despite all the attention we've given to the problem of foreign competition during the past few years, only 44% of manufacturing executives consider establishing a competitive international position a very serious problem. But 56% of the engineer sample with experience on the factory floor 
or involved with product design are worried about overseas competition. Those of us in business and government who are worried about trade imbalances must do more to warn about the real challenges and opportunities of foreign competition. We must convince all U.S. executives that they must look beyond U.S. markets, otherwise, otherwise our nation will lose out in the race to commercialize a number of new technologies which show great promise. Several months ago, technical experts within the Commerce Department put together a list of emerging technologies to be of economic importance in the year 2000. That list included advanced materials, electronics, automation, biotechnology, computing, medical technology, and thin layer technology. The group also noted the rapid emergence of high temperature superconductors and suggested that once its technical difficulties are solved, it too could be added to the list of technologies of special economic importance. I mention this study for several reasons. First, in our enthusiasm over the new superconductors, we can't overlook the similar promise of other emerging technologies. We must devote resources to these technologies because they will help determine our competitive position in the 21st century. And we must change the government policies and industrial attitudes that hinder the commercialization of these technologies. If we don't, the odds are good that we'll have to add superconductivity and other emerging technologies to the list of technology-based industries we've handed to our competitors. Maybe that error was predictable, but we should learn from it. What happened was we started out strong in the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s, beating the competition handily. But the competition improved, and we found ourselves in a bruising battle in which other countries worked hard and took away sales in both our domestic and foreign markets. They didn't always play by the rules of the game, and sometimes took unfair trade advantage by raising artificial barriers to our sales abroad and by subsidizing their sales here. But to make matters worse, they also used our own methods, our technologies, against them, and we let them do that. This competition is far from over, but now we, government, business, and academia, are aware of it. If we do nothing more than we've been doing, conducting business as usual, we'll stand little chance of exploiting these new technologies. We must do several things to see that this doesn't happen. First, we must insist that our competitors play by the rules and do not resort to unfair trade policies. This administration is doing that, as we've shown in dealing with the Japan on semiconductors, and we'll do it again whenever and wherever necessary. And the private sector must continue to trim management layers, increase factory productivity, and improve product quality. That means making sure that, demanding in fact, our business schools are equipping their graduates to deal with production problems and manufacturing innovations, as well as financial concerns. It also means giving greater corporate recognition for the role of the manufacturing engineer on the factory floor and making sure that engineering issues get the highest possible attention within the corporation. And we must speed up the innovation process. The traditional cycle of conducting R&D, doing product design and then going into manufacturing is too time consuming for the, to, for the technologies of the times. We must do everything possible to shorten that cycle from laboratory R&D to the introduction of a final product. In the case of superconductivity, that means companies must start planning now for the products that we think laboratory research will make possible in the months and years ahead. Company staff and management must participate in and stay knowledgeable about the efforts which government, laboratories, and universities are making. And finally, we must pay more attention to the seriousness of the international competition we face 
and adapt to that competition by changing our approaches to R&D marketing and management. I'm not suggesting that we abandon the American way of doing things or that we imitate our foreign com competitors who frequently band together in a way that in this country we would find unacceptable both philosophically and politically. We do need to do a better job of cooperating within the existing economic and government framework to share financial risks and increase the chances that we will be first to come up with a better product. I'm concerned that months after the initial laboratory experiments indicated high temperature superconductivity was a reality, this country still doesn't have a single consortium of companies, universities, and federal agencies working on this technology. I hope this conference can end with an agenda for splitting up the job so that companies, universities, and government laboratories won't duplicate what each is doing. I urge you to talk with your colleagues here and leave with a plan for cooperative action. I also urge those of you from industry to take advantage of the huge investment federal agencies are making in this field. Don't leave here without finding out the results of those investments, making plans to use the results of that work. We can't let this opportunity pass us by. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ernie. I know we both wish that Mac Baldridge would have been here to deliver that, but we very much appreciate your standing in. Uh, our next session is on the future applications of high temperature superconductors in electronics, computers, and communications. And we're very fortunate to have a distinguished leader of one of the industrial organizations which itself has been at the forefront of high temperature superconductivity research and I believe will be at the forefront of the applications of these new materials in the near future. Dr. Praveen Chadari is the Vice President for Science in the Research Division of IBM and Director of the Physical Sciences Department at the IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights, New York. Dr. Chadari began his career with IBM in 1966 and has held several management positions, becoming most recently vice president in 1982. He's currently responsible for physical science research activities in IBM facilities at Yorktown Heights, New York, Zurich, Switzerland, and Almaden, California. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Praveen Chaudhary. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you've heard by now, superconductivity, or the phenomenon of superconductivity, is not new. Superconductivity was discovered about almost three quarters of a century ago by Kamalinga Onis in 1911. And people have talked about applications of superconductivity ever since then. What is new today, as opposed to, say, 18 months ago, is that the superconducting transition temperature has jumped by a factor of four over what it was, say, in January of 1986. This is in contrast to a factor of three ever since superconductivity was discovered. And what we're hoping for is if it jumps another factor of four, we'll have superconductivity at room temperature. And that certainly would be very exciting. The jump in transition temperature translates, as far as this session is concerned, into several important considerations. Let me just touch on two of them before I turn the session over to our speakers. The first of it is, that the cooling requirements ease up. In other words, we have flexibility and mobility in anything we build if we want to carry it or if we want to implement it. The second important factor from the standpoint of the electronics industry is that you can now begin to think of combining semiconductor technology 
with superconducting technology. Let me elaborate on this point since it's something that's rather important in, in its development. Um, as you probably know, if you're not, I'll take a little while to explain it. Semiconductors operate on the principle that you introduce in a semiconductor a controlled amount of charge. You then move this charge around by applying electric field. That's basically how a transistor uh, operates. And the way you introduce the charge is by putting controlled amount of impurities in the material. If you lower the temperature, you find that the impurity tends to keep the charge to itself. In fact, at helium temperatures, these impurities are what's called not ionized. In other words, they do not give up their impurity, and therefore there is no charge in the semiconductor. So you can see with the old superconducting technology, you could not really integrate semiconductors with it simply because the semiconductor devices would not operate. Now that situation changes fairly quickly if you reach liquid nitrogen temperature. There are a number of electronic devices that in fact operate better at liquid nitrogen temperature than they do at room temperature. And the reason for that, again, is that as you cool something, the carriers, they do not scatter off the impurities or defects that are present in the solid. This scattering is reduces, therefore the effect of velocity of the electron increases, and that increases the performance of the device. So we have here a unique opportunity, and that of combining semiconductor technology with superconducting technology. And that, I think, is very exciting. And as you'll see, the word hybrid is often used in connection with that, and you'll hear some examples of that today. The third fact, I think, which I find perhaps the most important is uh, most significant is that the things we'll talk about is a collection of wisdom, if you like, that we've gathered over the last 75 years, when high temperature superconductivity was no more than a gleam in our eyes. Now that it's here, I think we'll begin to think much more productively, and in fact, we rely on an audience such as you to take this information back and come up with inventions which will actually shape the future, far more than what we're going to tell you about based on the wisdom we collected so far. In the talks today by Professor Van Duzer and Dr. Bedard, you'll hear ab about a number of important applications, electronics and communication and computers, where superconductivity has the potential to add new functionality, improve performance, reliability, and cost effectiveness. Without further delay, let me introduce the first speaker, Professor Van Duzer. Professor Van Duzer got his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in 1960. Apart from a few years at the Hughes Aircraft, he's been at the faculty at the University of California at Berkeley since then. He's been a visiting professor at a number of universities around the world, the Technical University in Vienna, the Catholic University in Chile, Rutgers in New Jersey, that's in the United States, uh, Kyoto, University of Paris, and Aristotelian University in, in Greece. Professor Van Duze had done research in superconductor electronics for nearly 20 years at the University of California. He has published ab about 100 technical papers, more than half of which are superconductor devices and circuit. He's been the editor of two special issues of the journal, the Institute of Electric and Electronic Engineers and Superconductor Electronics. He's co-authored with Turner, the only textbook on the subject designed specially for electrical engineers. For those of you who want to rush out and buy it, the book is called Principles of Superconducting Devices and Circuits. He's very active in both national and international scene and in, in having workshops and conferences in superconductor electronics. Today, he will cover the area of future applications in electronics and communication. Professor Van Duzer. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity to talk about my favorite technical subject to so many people. The first slide, please. I'm going to first, this is a, going to be a somewhat tutorial talk, uh, I hope, hopefully useful. I'm going to talk about some of the important properties of superconductors and, and some devices. Uh, I'll talk about low loss films for uh, RF applications. I'll talk about the National Bureau of Standards Volt Standard. Uh, talk about the millimeter and submillimeter receiver application. And, <clears throat> and then about analog signal processing work that's being done at Lincoln Laboratories. 
and uh, talk about analog to digital converter and shift register work that we're doing at Berkeley, and then uh, say something about what I think about the future of electronics with the high temperature superconductors. Next slide, please. <coughs> Here I've listed some of the important uh, properties of superconductors. Uh, zero resistance, uh, this is a, a much uh, touted thing about superconductors. It, it, what it really means is zero resistance for DC currents. If you have microwaves uh, uh, passing currents through the superconductors, the losses are low but not zero. I'll talk about, well, an another property is magnetic flux exclusion that was mentioned this morning, called the Meissner effect. Uh, magnetic quantization, uh, magnetic field is quantized in superconductors as in no other technology. And <coughs> this little This little figure here is to indicate how you uh, see this quantization. If you have a superconducting loop with magnetic field passing through it, the m amount of magnetic field in there has to be some multiple of a flux quantum. Uh, there's an energy gap in superconductors, which is uh, somewhat analogous to an, a semiconductor energy gap that was, and this was mentioned this morning. Uh, the really unique uh, what well, one very important, unique feature, important to uh, electronics, is Josephson effects in tunnel junctions and other uh, kinds of uh, weak links. And uh, then there is an interference effect that is analogous to optical interference, and I'll talk about uh, an application of that. Next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, this, is a, this is a terrible picture of, of uh, electron pairs. The real pairing phenomenon in superconductors is much more complicated. And I once saw a picture like this, and I laughed about it. But it's awfully hard to explain what a real pair is like. Anyway, the electrons somehow form pairs. And th they can move through the uh, crystal of the material without having any collisions. And the little, the green ones are the single electrons, which can have collisions either with the vibrating atoms or with impurities in the material. Next slide. The, uh, this is pointing up again what I said before, that, that if you, if you have a, a DC current flowing through a superconductor, then in fact there are no losses. Uh, however, if you have an RF field applied to a superconductor, the, uh, the uh, fluid of electrons has to slosh back and forth inside the superconductor. This requires that there's some electric field in the superconductor, and this accelerates the single electrons, and there are, in fact, some losses. Now, what, what we would like to do is to make thin films of these materials. And in the, in the uh, bottom picture here, I have shown a typical thin film transmission line, uh, which is called a microstrip. And there are two superconductors separated by a, a thin insulating film. And we would like to use these for interconnections in various kinds of circuits, possibly all a totally superconducting circuit, possibly as a transmission line in a semiconductor millimeter wave. Uh, amplifier, some uh, millimeter wave device, um, and, and uh, another application that I'll talk about a little later. The, uh, the point is that we, we think that these superconducting thin film transmission lines will be low loss. Uh, we ha that has yet to be proved. Uh, it's probably one of the first applications that we'll see in electronics will be the application of these transmission lines, if they indeed turn out to be low loss in the microwave and millimeter wave range. Next slide, please. Okay, now I want to spend a little bit of time telling you what a Josephson junction is because it's so central to uh, electronics. In the, uh, the top picture, there's a, uh, it says sandwich type 
device. And in the bottom picture, there's a device that I call a coplanar device. Now, sandwich type Josephson junction, cl the classical junction, had a very thin insulating barrier, about a 10 atomic layers thick of insulator between the two superconductors. Uh, you can make other sandwich type structures with, uh, with other kinds of material, for instance, a semiconductor between the two superconductors. The bottom type of device requires only a single layer of the superconductor, in, and then you make a strip of it and cut a gap, a gap about one millionth of an inch, or uh, one ten millionth of an inch wide, and then you can put a little metal strip across it and also make another kind of Josephson device. Now, in, in electronics, the thing that we usually care about a device is what its IV characteristic is. That is the relationship between current and voltage. And there's a little experiment set up on the left side of the of screen here. And uh, there's a, a current source that's connected to a, a junction. And you start out by turning up the current from zero that's passing through the junction, and then you look at the IV characteristic, you look at what voltage develops across the junction as you raise the current. I can't make this. Uh, please stay on that same slide. Okay. If you look at the uh, curve in the top right-hand side of this, uh, what you see is that okay look up here as you raise the current what happens is you can you can pass current right through the insulating barrier without any voltage at all across the junction and then when it gets to a certain limiting value it has to jump across if you push any more current through it and then you go up this part of the characteristic and back down like this. And in the type of superconductors that we've been using up to now, in lead and niobium, this voltage where it drops back down is called the gap voltage and has a value of about 2 millivolts. In the new superconductors, that's about 10 times that value. Now the other, if you did the same experiment with the other type of I, uh, Josephson junction, what you'd find is that the current would go up and then go up this way and come back down like this. Now this type of characteristic uh, I, we can call non-hysteretic and this type of characteristic hysteretic. And they have different, uh, in, among the electronics applications, you have need sometimes for this type of characteristic and sometimes for this. And I point out that the typical currents that pass through the, these devices are between 10 microamperes and about 1 milliampere, which is also characteristic of semiconductor devices. Next slide, please. <coughs> and I'd like to comment on uh, the difficulty of making these devices. One of the things that we're going to be, we're going to have to do very soon when we get good films is try to make Josephson devices since they're the heart of the electronics applications. Now, if you look at the bottom first, the coplanar devices, uh, I would say that we can do that with only moderate difficulty. And the reason I say that is because you need only one layer of the high temperature superconductor. That's the important thing to keep in mind is that these high temperature superconductors not only operate at high temperatures, but until now, at least, they have to be fabricated at high temperatures. So if you only need one layer of these materials, uh, it's going to be a much easier problem. So I think that we can do this, do the coplanar devices reasonably quickly. The sandwich devices are a different matter. In one case, uh, there are some applications where you might be satisfied to have one of the electrodes at a, with that of the high temperature material and the other electrode of a lower temperature superconductor. There are some applications where you're willing to use four Kelvin cooling, but with the higher gap, vol the higher gap voltage would work advantageously. And again, I think that can be done with moderate difficulty. To make both electrodes in a sandwich-type device, 
of this high temperature superconductors it means that after you form the barrier for the tunnel junction you're going to have to form the top electrode at a very high temperature and the question is can any barrier that you form stand up under that temperature so i think that's going to be a tough challenge the next slide please all right now i'm going to start talking about applications and the first one i want to show you is uh, work done at the bureau of standards in boulder where they have uh, made a volt standard the uh, volt has been maintained since 1972 uh, using a Josephson junction. But now they have, in the last few years, have developed a technique where they can take a, a long series of junctions, and there are about 2,000 junctions in series here. And this is a connection to a microwave system. So you feed microwaves in here, and it develops a DC voltage across these 2,000 junctions, which is on the order of one volt. And it's a very nice, stable voltage source. Next slide, please. It's, this is what I just showed you is mounted down in the tail here, and this is the microwave connection. Next slide, please. And this is the complete system. This is a helium doer. This, the microwave is fed down into the device, which is down in the doer. This is the electronics for it. And you can essentially dial up the voltage that you want to a few parts in 10 to the 10 to the eighth. Next slide, please. And the latest thing that they've done now in the last e about a year is to have uh, 15,000 junctions in series. And across this now, you get about 10 volts DC. And again, with the same kind of accuracy. And this can be used to calibrate things like Zener diode sources, which are very portable. Okay, the, uh, after, now going on after this, I'm going to talk about the millimeter and submillimeter wave receiver and about signal processing. And this is work that's largely uh, been supported by DOD and uh, to some extent also by the National Science Foundation. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a, says millimeter wave, but uh, take that to include submillimeter. So it's a millimeter or submillimeter wave receiver. The front end of any superheterodyne receiver looks like this. Essentially, all receivers are made this way. Uh, there's a, an antenna which the signals are fed into a device called a mixer. And there's a, uh, a, an oscillator, which is called the local oscillator, that also feeds into the mixer. And you mix all the signals coming in from the antenna with the signal, a single frequency signal from the local oscillator. And then there's an amplifier here, which is a tuned amplifier. So it will pass, it says IF amplifier, that's intermediate frequency. Uh, it, you could also think of it as an IF amplifier. If you are in a certain range of frequencies, they'll pass through there. Uh, so it selects out the frequencies that are, the difference frequencies that are a, a particular uh, value. And this means that when you set the frequency of the local oscillator, you pick out which of the stations or which of the signals coming from the antenna are going to go through the, through the system. Next slide, please. OK, there's the receiver again over here. Uh, this, the, this chart I will describe has to do with the mixer and also with this intermediate frequency amplifier after it. This is a, a chart that, that uh, tells about the sensitivity of the receiver. This is receiver noise temperature, or equivalently noise figure, on the other side. And uh, that measures how much noise the receiver adds to whatever's coming in on the antenna. So if the, re if the internal noise of the receiver is very small, that means you, can, you will be able to sense very small signals. So it measures the sensitivity of the receiver. And the thing, uh, the frequency, this is frequency along here. So this is one gigahertz, one billion cycles per second, 10 billion cycles per second, 100, 1,000. And uh, in the parlance that's used for receivers, about from the middle of this block to the middle of that block is called millimeter waves. 
and then beyond that is called sub sub millimeter waves and the millimeter refers to the length of a wave prop of electromagnetic wave propagating through free space ok now notice that uh, up here it says 300 Kelvin uh, devices all of the the noise in all room temperature devices lie above that curve so uh, if you want more sensitive receivers you have to cool them down here this this line is the limit set by quantum mechanics so you can't do any better than that okay there are some cooled semiconductor devices up here and everything else in here is a superconducting device now SIS means superconductor insulator superconductor tunnel junction and the receiver the noise associated with the receiver uh, <coughs> excuse me for, with the whole receiver is here and the noise that's attributed to just the mixer is here and again for higher frequencies there are other points here the point is that all of the best front ends for millimeter and sub millimeter wave receivers are made with superconducting electronics next figure please <coughs> Okay, one of the uh, peculiar phenomena in Josephson junctions is called the AC Josephson effect. And what it means is that if you put a voltage across the junction, and suppose it's just a DC voltage, you put this voltage, connect the voltage to the junction, what happens is that even though the voltage you apply to the junction is DC, the current that passes through the junction is AC. And in fact, AC at a very high frequency, if you put one microvolt across the junction, uh, the, the frequency of oscillation of that current is 484 megahertz. That's 480 million cycles per second. And that, with one microvolt across there, you're at the bottom of the microwave band. If you put a millivolt across there, that's 484 gigahertz and so you're well up in you're above the millimeter wave band you're into the sub millimeter wave band with this oscillating current okay so the reason I'm telling you this at this point is because I want to talk about the local oscillator for this receiver one point about this is that the frequency of oscillation of this thing will change as fast as you can change the voltage and you can change the voltage easily in less than 10 to the minus 9 seconds. And uh, the, the bad news is that the power output from a single junction is very small. It's only 10 to the minus 9 watts. Next slide. Now, the 10 to the minus 9 watts is not enough for the local oscillator, but there's a way out of that, and that is that if you make a series array of these junctions, so you have n junctions in series. The power from n junctions increases as a square of the number of junctions. So if you make 10 junctions in series, you get 100 times the power that you get from a single one, and that is enough for the local oscillator. So there, then we can think of an extremely agile local oscillator that will tune this receiver in less than 10 to the minus 9 seconds. So we can switch switch around the receiver frequency very rapidly. Okay, the next slide, please. Now, the intermediate frequency amplifier itself, uh, while it uh, was part of the factor that determines the, re the sensitivity of the receiver, uh, since, it's a, since it is involved in that, you want this device to also have a low noise property and one way to do that is to make what's called a parametric amplifier. And I don't have time to try to describe parametric amplifiers, but there is a, uh, a necessity for a nonlinear property, uh, which means that if you increase, say, as an example of nonlinearity, if you pass uh, two times as much current through something, you don't get two times as much voltage across it. It's some other number. And uh, so what you need in general, generically, for parametric amplifiers is a nonlinear property. Well, it turns out that if you bias 
these, uh, a Joseph's injunction at zero voltage and then apply an AC signal to it, there is a nonlinear, it behaves as a nonlinear inductor. And so there's work going on, uh, people have successfully made this type of amplifier with very low noise for use for intermediate frequency amplifiers. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, after you get the signals, you've received the signals through your broadband, very sensitive, uh, superconductive receiver, then you want to uh, work on them to extract information from them, and that's called signal processing. And you can do signal processing either digitally or uh, by analog means. And I'll talk about some work now in the next slide at uh, Lincoln Laboratories. Uh, this, this is uh, a Lincoln Labs slide, as you can see. And the, the sensor is the receiver that I just talked about. And in the middle here is a signal processor, and there are a whole bunch of different kinds of functions that you can do with these analog uh, signal processors, match filters, correlators, etc. And uh, then coming out the tail end of this thing, you need to convert the signal the uh, processed signal, you need to convert that to digital form and then pass it through something like a computer that uh, Dr. Bedard is going to talk about after I finish, uh, which is a, this all the data processing is done digitally. So I'll get down this far in what, I, what comes next. Okay, next slide, please. <coughs> Okay, this is a superconductive transmission line. It's like the microstrip line that I showed you before, except that there are two ground planes on this. And uh, <coughs> there are some electrical, important electrical reasons for doing that. This is a, a superconducting strip here, and then there's a superconducting strip here, and, and one at the bottom. And the orange stuff is uh, an insulating layer. Okay, they're, they're actually shown here, two of them. There's one transmission line there and another one here. And if you make these far enough apart, the electromagnetic fields associated with these are close enough in here that there's no interaction between these two lines. If you move the lines closer together, they'll couple to each other. And that's advantageous sometimes. The next slide, please. Okay, this, this is a, a two-inch silicon wafer on which has been made a three-meter long transmission line in a spiral form, and you can see it spiraling around. There are actually two parallel uh, spiral lines that are three meters long, and uh, this, you can, if you look at the inset here, which is a photograph of, of this region, you can see that they have, have purposely adjusted the spacing between the two lines, and, the, and they do that for a quarter of a wavelength of the electromagnetic signal at, at that uh, frequency that they're using. And uh, this, this is all, this uh, transmission lines on here are all superconducting, and this is what's called a chirp filter, and it's something that's used as a component in the uh, signal processing systems. The important thing is the bandwidth. This is a very wide band system, 2,000 megahertz wide. And uh, they think that they can take this up to 10,000. And so this will be, uh, do the same kind of function as a surface acoustic wave de device does now in uh, radar systems, but it will, will do it with superconducting lines at a much wider bandwidth so that they'll be able to process much more information in this system. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I, I won't go through all the details of this, but I just wanted to show you the way that this filter uh, that I just showed you can be used. This is one of them here, and this is another one, and this is a superconductor, superconducting mixer, an SIS junction mixer. And what the, the function of this is to take a spectrum of uh, frequencies, all different frequency signals, and turn it into a function of time that has the same form as that, because they would like to measure the form of this. And uh, when they turn it into a function of time, then they can take samples of that and then uh, do digital processing. And this is what's called Fourier transform analysis.
And there are all the other, the same type of device is used for correlators and convolvers and so on. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, next I'll talk about analog to digital conversion and a shift register. And next slide. Okay, just to tell you what analog to digital conversion is. This, this is a signal, it's a voltage as a function of time, and it's a continuous function, this dark line here. And all, all things in nature are analog. Uh, every, nothing is digital, nothing happens dig digitally except with your fingers. As a, as a function of time, all signals are analog. And what we want to do is to get a digital representation of that. And so what you do is at very precisely uh, determined intervals, called the sampling interval, you take little samples. And you take your sample very fast because if you take it too slowly, the signal changes and so you don't have an accurate representation of it. You want just one number that represents the value of the signal at each of these points. And then, uh, so you obtain that sample and you hold it, and then um, in the time, during this sampling interval, you, you determine its digital value, and then you turn that into a, a binary single signal. So that's the job of the A to D, or analog to digital converter. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now I have to tell you about one more uh, element of a Josephson Junction electronics circuit. And this is uh, what's called an interferometer, also called a squid. And a squid means superconducting quantum interference device. Now, if you, the way it's made is that you take a superconducting strip like that and make a loop of it and have a Josephson junction here and a Josephson junction here. You pass a current through here, and then you look at the IV characteristic, and you look at this maximum zero voltage current that can be passed through. So you pass as much current as you can through that device without exceeding this, this uh, uh, critical current. And then you put, pass a magnetic field through the loop and change the value, increase the value of magnetic field from zero upward. And watch how this maximum zero voltage changes. And what you see is that it's a periodic effect. So if you increase the magnetic field, it just varies periodically like that. Now that periodicity is something that does not appear in semiconductor electronics. And it's one of the things that that kind of an effect is one of the things that we might find useful in trying to make hybrids of semiconductor and superconductor devices. Okay, the next slide shows a, a configuration of analog to digital converter for a four-bit converter, which depends on that periodicity. Now, this has been done in an optical system at uh, Lincoln Labs, and uh, we have done it at, in a, uh, and also at the Bureau of Standards has done it in a uh, superconducting system using that periodicity that I just showed you. Okay, now notice that there are one, two, three, four input circuits for a four-bit converter, and that depends, doing that depends on this, uh, this periodicity that I just talked about. So you have a resistor divider here, which is a binary divider. This is the least significant bit, most significant bit. The data that comes out of the back of this is in what's called gray code, and so you need to have a, an encoder here which converts the gray code to natural binary. And the next slide shows a realization of this that we made at Berkeley. Uh, this is the resistor divider here. These are the four input circuits the so-called comparators. This is all made with superconducting technology and there are Josephson junctions. Each of the, this structure has four Josephson junctions in it. This one has four and this one has four, this one has four. There are a total of 128 Josephson junctions in there. And we, we clocked this at one billion times a second, one gigahertz, 
the data comes out the back so fast out of these out of these circuits that there are no test circuits that can handle it so we had to put another set of circuits on here which are clocked at a lower frequency and pick out samples from this in order to prove that the circuit worked okay we the next view graph next slide shows uh, another type of a to d converter where you have instead of one input circuit for each of the four bits uh, there are, you, eat, you now have, as in semiconductor circuits, one input circuit for each digital level. And for four, four bits, you need 15 digital levels. So there are 15 of these circuits. And then you take these outputs of these, pass them through an encro encoder, and go to natural binary. And we're also working on this type of device in our group. In the next slide, shows the, these are the comparator circuits here, 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 here. And these are some of the resistors and other elements that are associated with it. The next slide shows the encoding circuit to take those digital outputs and convert that into natural binary. And this is a, this is a device that according to circuit simulation, looks like it should have an, have a, an analog bandwidth of several gigahertz. Okay, the next slide, please. Another thing that we're working on is a shift register. Uh, one of the problems, if you have a device, a very wideband system, you have a system that gives you a digital output at a very high frequency, is that you, or very high rate, is that you have to do something with it. And uh, if, if, for instance, our uh, a to D converter works and we get data coming out of the back of that A to D converter at say three billion samples per second, we have to do something with all that information. And one thing that you can do is to put it into a serial memory. So this, this is a serial memory circuit where you put data at the input to the circuit and each time you flash the clock, the data advances along through this circuit. And so you can make a long serial chain of digital data representing some signal. And then uh, you can stop and read it slowly out the end or also read it out the side. The particular circuit that we're working on now has these, is made up of these uh, superconducting quantum interference devices or squids, it looks like this. So one of these blocks here has in it five uh, circuits that look like that. So there are actually four for the writing and one for the reading. We have simulated this with a circuit simulator and it seems to work correctly at 60 billion times if you clock at a rate of 60 billion times per second. Or 60 gigahertz. Next, next slide, please. 